We gather together for this 38th annual Philosophy Theology Symposium at Walsh University as a tribute to the legacy of the brothers of Christian instruction and to grow in our understanding of the vital relationship between faith and reason. Founded in 1819, the Brothers of Christian Instruction aimed at providing education for the children of the working class and bound themselves to the mission of making Jesus Christ known and loved. Almost 200 years later, the mission continues in new forms and figures, but with the same passion and resolve which inspired the original founders and missionaries of the brothers. Coming to us all the way from Paris, France, Jean-Luc Marion embodies the mission of the brothers through his commitment to intellectual integrity and his undying love for love. In his book, The Erotic Phenomenon, Marion chides modern philosophers for forsaking love dismissing it without a concept, and finally throwing it to the dark and worried margins of their sufficient reason, along with the repressed, the unsaid, and the unmentionable. Instead, Marion proposes a remembrance of the erotics of wisdom, the fact that love and love alone is what is most reasonable, itself falling under an erotic rationality. Only love can give answer to the vanity of knowledge, to the menace of self-hatred, to the futility of reciprocity condemned to a mechanical economy of exchange. In turning our attention to love, Marion has given intellectual flesh to what St. Margaret Mary Alacoque and St. Thérèse of Lisieux have called the science of love. For this, we thank him and honor him as our keynote speaker today. Jean-Luc Marion is Professor Emeritus of the History of Modern Philosophy and Metaphysics at the University of Paris Sorbonne and the Greeley Professor of Catholic Studies and Professor of the Philosophy of Religions and Theology at the University of Chicago. He is a member of the French Academy and studies both the history of modern philosophy and contemporary phenomenology. In the former field, he has published several books on René Descartes, including Cartesian Questions on the Ego and on God, and on Descartes' Metaphysical Prism. He is pursuing a long-term inquiry into the question of God in his books The Idol and Distance and God Without Being. He initiated a phenomenology of givenness including the original notion of the saturated phenomenon, especially in his books, Reduction and Givenness, Being Given, The Crossing of the Visible, and In Excess. This led to further works entitled The Erotic Phenomenon, The Visible and the Revealed, and finally, Negative Certitudes. In a more theological style, he has most recently published In the Self's Place, an Approach of St. Augustine. Awarded with the 1992 Grand Prize of Philosophy by the French Academy and the 2008 Carl Jaspers Prize, Professor Marion has also worked in the areas of Greek and Latin patristics, the history of medieval and modern philosophy, aesthetics, and constructive theology. Please join with me in a warm morning welcome for Professor Jean-Luc Marion. Today, uh, as a follow-up of the previous analysis of the gift <coughs> as uh, uh, unreducible to the exchange, <coughs> I would like to, um, to discuss another dimension of the question of the, of the gift. <coughs> because maybe by chance or 
I think, for a stronger uh, reason. When we say the gift, there is another, uh, immediately another concept which may appear, which is that of the given. The given is not the same thing as the gift. The gift, we can conquer that and describe it in <coughs> starting, for instance, from the exchange. The, and this <coughs> is, <coughs> to some extent, an immediate experience. <coughs> the given uh, comes from another, uh, another horizon. It is a more philosophical uh, concept. The given, <coughs> to start with, uh, appeared perhaps uh, mostly in modern philosophy under the name of the sense data. That is the, the, the statement made by uh, uh, British empiricist uh, that at the beginning and this beyond any uh, discussion and argumentation we experience uh, some atoms so to speak of knowledge uh, which are given because there are the same data the pure and atomic uh, sensation of sound, of color, of uh, heat or cold, and so on. Uh, this is an assumption. Uh, uh, be careful. Uh, it is not enough to claim to be uh, an empirist uh, to uh, think without presupposition, because precisely there is a presupposition of empiricism, which is that there are sense data, that they are, that we start to think because we wake up, so to speak, by getting from the outside some units, from uh, uh, some dots, some bits some of, of information, uh, which come from senses and are uh, undivisible and uh, absolutely uh, 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 original. And what was, uh, so this is the original meaning in modern philosophy of the given. The point is that <coughs> In uh, uh, the last century, many uh, uh, philosophers, and among them uh, Selas, in a very uh, famous uh, collection of papers, Empiricism and the Philosophy of Mind, published in London in 1956, have criticized the possibility of the given understood that way, under the name of the critique of the myth of the given. And uh, this was uh, uh, repeated some few years later by Quine in a very famous paper published in uh, 1960 in the Philosophical Review, Two Dogma of Empiricism. So what was the argument against the sense data? That is, again, the assumption of philosophers like, say, Locke, uh, which was the most preeminent uh, uh, representative of that tradition. It is to say, as Selars used to say, that <coughs> for uh, empiricism, the given, that is the most simple, indivisible, immediate, and unquestionable uh, information coming through the sense. Uh, as a, is supposed to have a very strange privilege 
On one side, it is beyond question because it's completely immediate. We are passive, we do nothing, we just recall that and uh, uh, we registered uh, th this information which was not built up by us. It's why we can trust it. It is not our uh, work, our invention, our process. It was imposed to us so we can consider that this is the first real knowledge. But at the same moment, the, in empiricism, people argue that precisely this first certitude, immediate certitude, being a certitude, is the first step into building a real objective science. So, for instance, we say, uh, I, I today uh, hear some sounds, what I speak. Those sounds, I cannot question uh, their existence and the, and the reality of the experience. So this is a starting point of my uh, uh, scientific knowledge for this morning. But you see uh, the difficulty. The reason why we assume that we, can, we should trust the data is that they are immediate. But the reason why we think they may be the starting point of a knowledge, of, of an undisputable knowledge, is that they are objective. They should be both. Imagine that we you take the sense data as purely felt, received, experienced. Could say, well, yes, okay, it is und undubitable, but it is undubitable only for V1 who made the experience, the sense data, by definition, cannot be shared. It is, in its immediacy, cannot be shared. For instance, uh, 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 perhaps, uh, so this scarf is green, but we all agree about that. If perhaps not those who have uh, some disease, uh, so they, can, they are mixed up in between green and red. Let us say we, we are, uh, none of us uh, uh, is affected by that disease, so this is uh, green. Okay, we agree on that, but we, no one can know whether when we, we say green, we see the same green. We agree about green, but uh, what do you see? What, when, when you see green, do you see the same thing that I see? There is no way to, gather, to give any verify, uh, uh, to answer that question. So the, the, the sense datum can be perfectly certain, immediate, and completely subjective. It can be certain, and perhaps we cannot share it. There is no contradiction in that. When you, 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 you drink the same wine and you, so you agree that it is a great wine, <laughs> what do you taste? You cannot know what the other tastes at the same moment. So how, with this immediacy of the sense data, can you start the process of an objective knowledge? The objective knowledge should be uh, uh, precisely objective. It should be communicated and, uh, and, uh, and shared and uh, repeated and things like that, which is not the case of the sense data. So the sense data, in an empiricist view, is supposed to have two contradictory properties, to be absolutely subjective and to be the starting point of the objective construction. This cannot be done. So there is no way to, to, to imagine that we could go back in the scientific discourse to the bottom of it, and at the bottom of it, there will be no more proposition, abstract proposition, rules, uh, laws, and things like that, but sense data to verify the proposition. We can never do that. 
The sense data can never verify a proposition. It is always the objective interpretation of the sense data which is the first step. But between the sense data and the uh, inter objective interpretation of the sense data, there is a gap. And that gap shall never be filled unless through the rational activity of the mind. But there is no immediacy of the first object. This is the argument of Sellers and uh, of Quine and of Neurath against logical positivism. It's why the usual and uh, I would say uh, 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 banal area man uh, empiricism is not a strong position in philosophy, but a very weak one. So far, so good. But you could exactly say the same thing about the given in phenomenology. Because my, uh, my position to highlight givenness as the final result of the third uh, reduction, as you referred to, and I thank you very much, uh, in the, intro in, in the introduction. What in phenomenology the given would mean, which would not be submitted to the same critic as Anderson Data. When I say that in phenomenology we make a reduction to, uh, uh, to know and to understand what is really given to us. We face the same difficulty. Let us uh, explain uh, what the relation between the given and reduction according to Husserl, for instance. When Husserl started to, uh, to, to work in philosophy, one of the questions uh, remaining undecided was the question of the uh, relation between what in the experience was given through the senses and what was not given through the senses. And so in the Marburg School, for instance, there were a large insistence on the fact that in the experience, most of what we can uh, uh, take into account is already interpreted from the beginning by uh, the understanding and not purely uh, uh, felt in the sensation. In fact, for those who make some, are interested in analytical philosophy, the position today of McDowell as a, is quite close to that of Natorp and other in the, uh, in the uh, school of Marbourg. The answer to that difficulty by Husserl was found with what he called the reduction. The point is this. When we uh, start to describe uh, a field of inquiry, objects, as we say, <coughs> That is, in fact, to record all information coming from the same uh, uh, region of the experience. The biggest threat is to take for granted, for experienced, what is not. It is not only to overlook a part of the uh, experience. That is, not to notice something that should be noticed because it was, in fact, experienced. It is, on the other way around, to uh, admit as if it was experienced, something which was not experienced, but uh, uh, deduced, uh, inferred, uh, assumed by association and things like that. So what we have to do is to check, to check each information or alleged information coming from the uh, experience. What does that mean to check? That means to make a reduction. To make a reduction, that is to, to see whether we have an absolute evidence 
of what we have assumed. This absolute evidence, how to describe it? That's the point. What is the criterion? Before Husserl, earlier, the criterion for a reduction or alleged reduction was either the clear and distinct idea, Descartes, but how do you explain that, the clear and distinct idea? What is the difference between a non-completely clear or distinct idea? Not that simple. So the traditional answer, the most simple answer, was that we have seen uh, previously, that of empiricism, to say a clear and distinct idea is a sense data. Only the sense data are clear and distinct. The, all the rest is confused and is uh, 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 far-fetched and uh, uh, constructed by abstraction. But as we have seen, this answer can be criticized. So we should find something else. And Husserl made this very important point to say that the reduction is a reduction to the given. That is, in fact, not everything we think about are, is given. Only some information are given. And the reduction is a way uh, carefully to, to, to measure, to establish how far, if or not, and if how far, something is given. Givenness be, be, being uh, the first way of presence of everything. Because, and this I think is very important, <coughs> uh, something can appear as an object and be given, but can be given without being yet an object. I mean by object, all the determinations uh, of the objects which allow us to product, pro, uh, to, to, uh, to, 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 to know the object and to reproduce the object. For instance, there are given which are not objects. They are given, that is, in the daily experience, some events are given, they are not objects. Uh, the experience of the other is given, but it is not the experience of an object. The experience of uh, the face of the other, uh, the experience, for instance, of, of beauty in any way, is given. But you cannot explain this as if it were an object. So there are a lot of given givenness, which is not yet and perhaps will never become an object. Same thing about beings. Some phenomena or something in phenomena may appear without being a being. <clears throat> when we experience uh, precisely the lack of something, the uh, lacking object of desire. Or when we experience uh, uh, anxiety, or uh, boredom, or uh, 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 grief, which to some extent close uh, any uh, possible uh, relation to the other. We don't experience beings. We experience precisely the uh, disappearance of beings. We have no access to the usual beings in those situations. But those are real phenomena. And uh, they open or close a large part of the world to us. So it is not a dream or a nightmare. It is a real experience of, the, of reality. But it is not the experience of reality as composed with beings. So there is a lot of 
in our experience which may be given without being an object or a being, one of the beings. And among this experience of givenness, there are degrees of givenness. That is, what the given is not always the same given. <coughs> not only there are some given are beings, objects, and other not, but there are degrees in givenness. For instance, we, we can make the experience of a very uh, strong uh, 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 <coughs> sensation. When you, uh, sensation of great pain or great joy or just uh, to see a great light uh, as in, as in Ejaya you will see a great light. So you are, uh, you are bedazzled by a great light. It is the maximum of, of givenness. But you see nothing. So um, in, when you are really bedazzled, you stop to see a precise infinite form. You cannot say that this is an illusion. It is not an illusion. <laughs> it is a fact, and it is a very strong experience. That experience but you facing an excess of givenness. So there are degrees in givenness. And the reduction, the role of the reduction is to uh, single out givenness and the degrees of givenness. And it is by doing so that we can make we can depart between the illusion, what we assume to be given, and the real thing, which is, this was already given. And starting the experience is starting from <coughs> the field of givenness. So <coughs> I have su suggested the principle that the more there is reduction, so the, the more carefully you check what is given and what is not given, the more you get the reliable given. And there is nothing beyond the givenness. Anything you accept, even under other names in the experience, at the end, at the bottom of it, amounts to givenness, has to be expressed in givenness. And givenness has no other presupposition than the experience that it is given. I have to start with that. The difficulty is not to start with the given, it is to identify what and how deep the given gives itself. That's the problem. And the phenomenological description uh, is completely based on that. <coughs> I mean, uh, <coughs> why in phenomenology, <coughs> the methodological uh, uh, decision is this. We shall not, as in a, a more uh, traditional way of uh, philosophizing, we shall not first argue, or we shall not first proceed by uh, deduction from principle and uh, general proposition into details. We shall try to make a point by a description. So, and to have answer to question, by making descriptions of the state of the things, which is very paradoxical, because by definition, a, a mere description should not give you uh, the means to make a decision, an intellectual decision. The best description, <coughs> at least, we could think that the best description could give you only what the description can give, that is the state of the thing as it is, but not a theoretical justification. So the, the fact to describe cannot justify. Perhaps it can. How far? If your description is a description with a reduction, most of the time we don't describe the things 
as given. We describe the thing as we already know them. And it is the way to understand the word in daily life. In daily life, we don't describe things. We get some informations. And immediately, we stop to describe, to collect further information. We are far enough with combining them with what we have already experienced, what we know for a long time ago, what we, uh, the theories we uh, were educated in, and so on, we can, without further ado, immediately not only complete the description, but come to a conclusion. When you, <laughs> when you get in your car, you use very few information. You don't describe your car. You don't try to understand what is going on. So you go to the parking lot. Your car is exactly at the same place where it was uh, 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 the night before. So, so far, so good. It's my car. Key open up. And, and you don't describe your car before uh, 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 starting the engine. You start the engine, you are not even yourself completely start, you start the engine, and that's it. So, you make no description. You are so used to the thing that you have no use of description, and no need. So, in the daily life, and we have very narrow descriptions. Most of what we think is assumed. On, 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 on sound grounds, good, good experience, uh, sound, uh, good uh, right theories, and so on. But you have no need to go into details. We repeat always the same thing. And in the uh, scientific uh, knowledge, we make only short and narrow description. It would be completely silly for uh, a physicist uh, when he, he has started uh, an experience uh, a week ago, so it is in the process, to each time he gets into the lab, to start again from the beginning with a complete description, uh, to check everything in the theory, to check the data, and so on and so on. So he has just to look at some few new informations, to register them, and to keep going. So we are efficient because we make no exhaustive description, because we assume much more than we really experience. And this is culture. This is to get used to something. You have no need to spend time for a full and exhaustive and uh, 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 going to the bottom of it description. And it's why we repeat ourselves. That is the price for this uh, quicker access to the usual use of the thing, so to speak, is that we have to trust the past, to trust the others, to assume something which is not checked. And be careful, this is true, first of all, not only in daily life, but in sciences. The doctrine uh, of uh, the uh, scientific re 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 revolutions uh, was mostly about this. That is, <coughs> science does not, is not in progress on a steady speed. There are moments when there is a big change. That moment is not the moment of the discovery of the new theory. It is a moment when the new theory is admitted by scientific institutions. That is, the changing the paradigm. And changing the paradigm is completely different than finding the new theory. It takes time, it may take time. Or never happen, why not? We don't know. And <clears throat> that is to say, there is a moment when people agree on the fact 
that what you have to take for granted to have the quick description needed to improve uh, the state of, of knowledge. What you have to assume and take for granted is this theory and not that theory anymore. So changing the paradigma is changing what you assume without checking it. And indeed, the more a science is developed, the more you have assumed. You have to assume unchecked theories. I would not uh, uh, say, well, for the relativity, I have to check it by myself before accepting it. It makes no sense. And it is not a scientific attitude to say that you have to trust. And this is rational. But that means that you don't describe. So we understand that to describe the, the state of the things is not a, it is a big deal. Most of the time, we don't do that even in scientific activities. In scientific activities, each specialist tried to, to have a better understanding, possibly description, in a very narrow field. And there are few of them in the world to compete and to check the description. More, but, but all the others, we have to assume that. So the question of assuming the description is central of, of uh, making the uh, real description is central. In that case, you understand that when a good phenomenologist make a, makes a description, that description is maybe surprising according to how far he can go in the reduction. In that case, the description may modify completely the picture. And to that extent, this new description, strictly, so to speak, revetted to the given, may become more than a description, but uh, an argument. And it's why uh, uh, very often a good reduction leads to a paradox. But the paradox in that case means a more accurate description with letting nothing assumed without being checked as given. This is the point. So if you admit that, what could we say to the objection to the myth of the given? In the objection to the myth of the given, which is the right uh, uh, objection, it is a right objection when made uh, toward the people who, uh, whom Seller and Quine gazed at, that is, Locke and his followers, and in the 19th century, the uh, logical positivism, Carnap and others. What they aimed at <coughs> was the contradiction of an immediate sign data which at the same moment could play the role of a first object. That is the dream of, an, of the immediacy of the first object, which after all is the dream of empiricism. The first object was not constructed by us, it is immedi immediately given. And so would this argument uh, keep is strength against the given as understood by phenomenology in reduction. That's the, that's the question. This objection is a very serious objection. It was made to my own work in, in France, where uh, people in the analytical tradition said, yes, uh, what you are doing uh, is well known. You are re-establishing the myth of the given. And we have arguments against that. So uh, I asked myself whether, after all, they may be right. <laughs> and what I discovered, it took me some time and some reading, is that the, the objection of Quine and Stellars against the myth of the given is based on this hypothesis. The given is an illusory immediacy of the object. 
that, that illusion which disqualify the given as a myth. In the case of phenomenology, do we face the immediacy of the object? Is the given an immediate object and certain because it is immediate? Indeed, in no way. What we have in phenomenology is not with the given, the experience of something immediate. The paradox is that the given is not immediate. Can be surprised to say the given comes from a mediation. It is nevertheless exactly the case. Let us see that in further details. <coughs> if the given is given only through the reduction, as Husserl was the first to say, when he says the, the uh, uh, givenness is the last uh, criterion, there is known other in phenomenology, something appears insofar as it is given, to the extent it is given, but this givenness is always a reduced givenness. By reduced givenness, he meant a givenness which is check, where we try to depart between what is given and what is only assumed and not given. If reduction is a condition to make the genuine given appear as such, the given needs a mediation, which is a reduction. So there is no, I would say, given, passively given, to some extent, to get the given, you have to check it, not to produce it, but you have to check it. So the critical moment, that is a reduction, makes the, make, contributes to the, to, to the givenness of the given. There is no given without reduction. And it's why uh, 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 the philosopher who start to study the, the givenness before Husserl, because there was a lot of them uh, in the Marburg School in particular, where they were always discussing uh, everything that could be given. And they were discussing what, what, what was given, what was not given, and things like that. The objects uh, given without signification, the empty signification, and uh, many other things. So, my long last, Tarnowski, uh, uh, Rickert, uh, Natorf, uh, and so on. So, so it was a, a common, uh, a common uh, stuff for all of them. And the guy who, fa who found the, the answer to that debate was Husserl. When Husserl says, the question is not the given, it is how far this given was checked by reduction. And the critical moment, that is the mediation, was crucial there. So there is no givenness without reduction. It's why givenness is not immediate, and it's why it may not be an illusion. So let us give some few uh, examples in my field of givenness, of, uh, of uh, this, the mediation of givenness. <coughs> Let us, uh, and this will be, I think, uh, let us take the example and I shall focus on that, <coughs> the example of uh, a, a phenological concept I tried to, to, uh, to make uh, uh, intelligible and acceptable, that of saturated phenomena, which I think is a good example of uh, the connection between givenness and reduction. Let us face the usual description of what truth is by Kant, Husserl, and I would even say uh, uh, former philosophers. 
to some extent, they all agreed on this definition of truth. Truth is the adequatio reiet intellectus, the equality between the thing and the understanding of the thing, which after all is obvious. Not without a lot of difficulties, but apparently obvious. Let us focus on a very simple uh, question, starting from this definition. And Kant is a good, uh, good, uh, good uh, uh, guide to that. Kant explains that uh, another way to describe the truth is to say that it is the moment when uh, the phenomenon is completely uh, uh, verified. It is verified when for him, as for Husserl, in, in a phenomenon, there are, I would say, two components. On one side, the concept, the idea you have in advance, so a concept of a, of a pen, but you, you know that there is a, something to, to put uh, the ink or anything like that, huh? and, and uh, you have a, a can behind with, uh, with uh, ink uh, and things like that. So this is required to have a pen, a fountain pen. And the other thing is intuition, that is to have the real thing in your fingers, the real thing with uh, that material or that material and things like that. So when the intuition match the concept and vice versa, at the end you have the thing. <coughs> if not, you have sensi the, the material without the form, so you are not the thing or you have the concept, the design, the idea, the project, but not the thing. And we, all of us, make the uh, experience that <coughs> we can uh, have the perfect truth of the phenomenon when there is the same, we we'll say, quantity, if this has a meaning, of intuition, than the concept, that no, no part of the concept remains empty uh, of uh, the uh, matching intuition. So you have a complete verification. Most of the time, we accept the phenomenon as true and understandable, even if some parts, a component of its concept of signification is not actually uh, matched by the, the intuition. And let us go back to your car this morning. Clearly, you have a broader concept of your car than an intuition of it. I mean, you know the uh, operations you have to do to handle your car and to, to drive, but you don't really experience how the uh, combustion room, the, uh, uh, the uh, say that, uh, sparkling system, uh, all this is actually working. You don't check that. You don't go into open the, with the hood and go down to, to the engine to make the experience by intuition uh, whether all the function of the engine, according to the concept, uh, actually uh, 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 are match in the real intuition. You don't do that. In fact, we use our car we, with a deficit of intuition. And uh, we don't feel guilty because we have not uh, 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 checked everything in the detail of the, uh, of the car. The better the car is, the less we need to have an intuitive verification of the concept of the car. <laughs> you do that when you have to fix the car. So when it is a, not a good car, but a good car allows you to have a huge deficit of intuition. 
And that is the best thing we can expect from the car, to keep our hands clean. So, in most of the time, we have phenomena with a deficit of intuition. And it is good. But in the real description of the experience, there is not only those two cases, the case where there is as much intuition as there is room, so to speak, in the concept, or when the case where, the usual case, where there is much less intuition than the concept could accept. There is a third case, which is never uh, uh, studied as such, either by Husserl or by Kant, which is a case where there would be much more intuition than the concept could ever uh, tolerate, accept, and uh, host, so to speak, an excess of intuition. And the excess of intuition is not a rare experience. We have all of us made that experience many times. When you have access to a phenomenon, and there is no doubt about the reality of that phenomenon, because it is characterized by an excess of intuition. What does that mean, an excess of intuition? You have no doubt that something is going on, but you don't understand what. You don't understand what because you have not the uh, matching concept. You have never seen, never experienced that. You just don't understand. It is beyond your mind, your conception, beyond your imagination, beyond what, uh, so you have no words to explain that. So this can be some, uh, something like September 11, which is a good example. No question that there was intuition there, and no question that no one could explain what was going on, the meaning of that. Not only because people had to admit that it was not an accident, but it was a, a, a terrorist act. But after that, uh, what is the meaning of that terrorist act? Why? Why us? Why now? And uh, what to do and things like that. There was no concept, ready at least. After that, you can interpret and try to buy up, to, to build up the needed concept. But at the moment, there was a lack of concept. This is the case for great historical events. But in our daily life, time to time, we face that kind of phenomenon, which cannot be questioned in their effectivity. There is an amount of, when you get through an accident or a great joy, there is no doubt that this is real. But you don't understand what is going on nevertheless. This is a saturated phenomenon. And in fact, our private lives are framed by those uh, uh, saturated phenomena. We have all experienced some of them, and we could live because of some of them, which remain uh, after years uh, saturated, that is, without the uh, sufficient concept. I think, uh, I don't know, uh, I think that, that people who, who are priests, they are still living with a saturated phenomenon, which was their vocation. And perhaps they don't, just don't know yet <laughs> what has happened that day. And when you are fortunate enough to, to, to love someone, and, uh, and uh, uh, you, you live because of a saturated phenomenon. Why that one and not that one? Why is he still working? I just don't know. So, and nevertheless, this is a saturated phenomenon because I cannot answer to the question why. But <laughs> the fact is that it is working. So I have no concept for a phenomenon for which I have an excess of intuition. In this kind of situation, a saturated phenomenon, <coughs> clearly it's about checking what is given. In the usual way of describing phenomena, as the 
saturated phenomenon, the excess of intuition, precisely being an excess of intuition, is a deficit of concept. We understand quite well that we don't pay attention first to the phenomena which we cannot adequately describe. It's the case of the saturated phenomena, which by definition cannot be easily described. So we have a tendency to keep that for the next day and for ourselves. And it's why usually we don't pay attention or take care of these saturated phenomena, although they are the center of our life. Only in a situation of reduction we pay attention to those phenomena because it is a very special case of checking givenness. You have a, a, a maximum in the degree of givenness. This is an example of a description of the given where the mediation of reduction is essential, crucial. That's why there is no immediacy of givenness in that case. And let us have another example. When you, <coughs> let us speak of a, a saturated phenomenon as a, the death of a loved one or uh, something like that, so you go into this, uh, this, uh, this period, that event, and uh, you try to, to overcome and to, to, to go through that, and uh, you need some help. So you need to speak to someone, a friend, a doctor, a therapist, anyway. What are you doing at that moment? Why do you need to speak to someone? The, the other will not take away the burden you have to, to, to bear. So, is that, a, it, and it is not about uh, distracting you from your pain. You have no intention to have fun with that guy. So why do, do you need to speak? The answer is, is very obvious. It is too difficult for you alone to make the interpretation of what you go through. That is, you need to have additional commentaries, additional explanation, additional interpretation, possible interpretations, to upgrade the level of the concept against the excess of intuition. You need to put words on what you feel. What does that mean? You need to uh, see the meaning of the intuition. And the intuition, the excess of intuition in that case, becomes a huge pain because in addition to the burden of intuition, painful as such, there is the additional pain that you don't understand the meaning of that pain. So you ask for what? For someone to help you to make the reduction and to, uh, to so it is the mediation which is needed. The mediation to face the given to be strong enough not to deny the given. Because most of the time, when we don't understand the given, we, we, we try to think as if there were no given. And so, to admit the given, you need a, a, a reduction. In that case, you need someone helping you to make the reduction. So this is a perfect example of the fact that the, the, the given <coughs> becomes the result, the result of an activity. And this will be my last point. <coughs> it is very strange that to 
There is another objection about uh, the phenomenology of, the, of givenness. It is so. If there is such self-giving given and so on, in that case uh, there is no subject left because uh, it would be entirely passive. No activity as just to, to get what gives itself. No. Again, uh, 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 this is a, a, a very abstract description. In fact, to receive what is given, you have to be active. Because most of the time, when something is given and we are not ready to accept it, we are not ready to accept it. Because, for instance, when the given gives an excess or uh, gives in excess or gives something completely unexpected or something that contradicts our expectation, which is our desire or needs, which is worse, in that case, what we do is very actively deny the, the given. So to accept the given, to receive the given, you have very actively to re, uh, reshape, redimension, reorganize your capacity. I mean capacity in, in the Latin meaning of capacity, capacitas, capere, which is what uh, uh, um, What uh, a reservoir de voiture, a reservoir, a tank. What the tank can get. Capacitas is the quantity of liquid a tank can get. Uh, there is, I think, it is, it is uh, uh, Horatius, the Latin poet, who says, "Capacissimus vir." A very capable man is a man who can drink a lot without being drunk. <laughs> this is the capacitas. Capacitas, the, the capacitas, uh, capax dei, has that meaning. The capacitas is an active uh, uh, attitude. You have to enlarge your capacitas, for instance, facing. Uh, the saturated phenomenon. So you have to work on yourself. You have to prepare. You have to evolve if you want to face the given. So here again, there is a mediation, an active mediation as in reduction. So let us conclude to, uh, by saying that <coughs> the, there is a possible critique of the given in the case of the myth of the given. The myth of the given, historically speaking, comes from empiricism with this contradiction that it should be both subjective and objective, and both in the immediacy. This is not the case with the given in phenomenological sense, because it is always connected to the mediation of either reduction or reception. So this being said, there is a third question, but there is no third lecture, so I shall not explain that. How we could connect the doctrine of the gift, as explained yesterday, reduced to givenness, and the doctrine of the reduced givenness itself. How far the gift and the given can be uh, identified? That's another question. I thank you very much. <laughs>